Yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lurking for Legends, a live video cast where we speak with people from all walks of the publishing industry. I'm Christy Stratus, owner of my own editing company, which you can find at proofpositivepro.com, and author of historical suspense books and short stories. And with me is my co host, Richard H. Stevens. He's an awesome co host, and he is an amazing prolific epic fantasy author so make sure you check out his books so lurking for legends is a live interactive broadcast as you can see and we encourage all kinds just everybody who's here to chime in with whatever questions you'd like to ask our guests uh, or simply make comments on what you hear on the show maybe even meet some new friends so tonight we have new adult and romance author max watson welcome max it is great to have you here hey everybody it's great to be here thanks for hosting thanks for having me yeah, absolutely. It's fantastic to have you. And you have, we really have so much to talk about with you, honestly. There's just a lot <laughs> going on. So tell us about your books, first of all. You have a number of them out them there already. So, you know, share with us what you've published. So I just technically debuted March of 2020. And the first thing that I came out with, I had promoted it as a psychological twisted fiction. And then the next one was a romance novella. And after that, it was it just was a sort of a standstill, and I didn't really know if I was doing wrong, but I'm sure we'll get to that point later. And I had to do a major rebranding where I discovered the first book that I had written wasn't psychological literary fiction at all. It was a dark romance. And so I had to do major rebranding on both of my first titles, and Chains of Nurture, my first book that was launched in March, got a new cover. And then my second book, which used to be Black and Blue, got a full redo to new title, new cover and everything to the second book, which is The Drunken Promise. And that's around the time I discovered what I was trying to do. So I started with psychological and I went to a romance novella and it wasn't clear what I was doing. It was like I was writing whatever I wanted and releasing it. Who was I writing this for? What was I writing about? And I had to sit down and figure out what my brand is. And it took a while because what's well, how is this connected, this twisted psychological dark romance and this sweet, normal-ish romance novella with a swipe, slight twist, what was the connection? And I discovered the new adult genre where it's anyone from around 18 to 30 who's trying to figure out who they are what they want to do with themselves. And so it's about, it's kind of like coming of age for adults is the best way to put it for people who aren't familiar. And so it was just kind of an aha moment. It's like, ah, new adult, that makes so much sense. Yeah. So once I had redone my book covers and figured out my genres, then I started to release one hour romances. And I just released my second one. The first one was for the Christmas season. That was Scarlet's Naughty Christmas. And then the second one was for Valentine's Day, I just released on the 26th of January, and that was Charlie's Sexy Valentine. And both of these are supposed to be read within about an hour or so. The idea is that you should be able to read it cover to cover while relaxing in a bubble bath. So I call it my bubble bath romance collection. And so that's about where I'm at right now. And I've got a lot of titles I'm planning throughout this year um, hopefully, if I don't want to promise anything that I can't commit to, especially with COVID nonsense, but I'm planning to continue releasing one bubble bath romance per month. And then I hope to have one major title coming later this year called A Nickel and a Trinket, as well as one novella that I have written just needs to be edited some more. So by the end of this year, I should have 15 or 16 titles published um, hopefully <laughs> hopefully we call them bubble bath bubble bath romances i saw that uh, a while ago and i thought that was really neat and uh, do all these stories they they all are they all in like a, i'm a fantasy author so are they all in the same universe like they, do they all belong together or are they totally separate stories and they're independent of each other so they are standalones but they do they're supposed to be just contemporary so that occurs in our world as it presently is minus COVID. That's the only tweak is COVID. We're just all going to pretend it doesn't exist for now. <laughs> so the, the, I so far haven't had any, I, any plans to have characters connect between any of the stories. So it's just planning so far to be one-off standalone short romances. But the only thing is 
I do have some hints at all of the titles that I string sprinkle throughout. There will be some mentions, but there won't be any char character or world connections between the titles, at least not so far. I was going to say, is that something that you plan like maybe in the future, that kind of thing? I think it would be fun if I would do a series, a few of just, I was thinking it'd be fun to have the way Nora Roberts used to do, where it'd be three sisters or three brothers, and it'd be each book would be them following their life story and how it connected. That was something I've toyed with. Um, as you guys may have seen from my author bio, I have interesting is to take that story of the last house that we flipped, which was an absolute nightmare and turn it into a romance trilogy and make it three brothers who had to suffer through what the heck my husband and I went through and how they endured the house, but also found love and, you know, all of that mushy stuff. <laughs> well, that's awesome. You talk about your bio and I, I read it and it sounds pretty interesting. You guys sound like you're very busy. Like you went from roofing to flipping houses and businesses to building race cars, ladder climbing, corporate America, and now you've just you anyway. I don't know about your husband, but you've you've kind of shoved that all aside and you've just devoted yourself to writing. Is that correct? Yep. So I am someone who cannot stand the idea of devoting 40, 50 years of my life to one company. I can't, that makes me physically sick to even have to apply for something like that with the knowledge that it would be even in the short term. Uh, but I have done about everything that one person could ever think of and of one of the major things that would be on your bucket list, building a race car, flipping a house. And I, I just, whenever I have something that just feels like the next big thing I want to tackle, I just run full force at it, which doesn't always fare well, especially for the bank account. That's for sure. It's a very expensive lifestyle to just go from hobby to hobby. The race car that I mentioned that I built was beautiful and extremely loud. And we never got to test it on the track, which is awful. But we had built it with a high performance. My husband and I had built our own engines side by side in this high performance class. And for years, my engine just sat there begging to be put in a car. And when we finally did, it was in a Pontiac Trans, or I wanted a Trans Am. We couldn't find one. So I got a Firebird close enough. <laughs> And it was so interesting. We had to put the entire assembly, transmission, engine, all that together, and then lift the car over it in our garage with just an engine lifter lifting the whole car over it. That was a um, terrible project. It was a really <laughs> dumb idea. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. Never really got to drive it too much. And... We ended up just recently parting it out, and my poor race car now sits in a junkyard. Oh, just, just, RIP. So you no longer have it. We no longer have it. We had to part it out to make ends meet because of this COVID nonsense at first, and right. because, well, I couldn't put a baby in the back, and it was like, where are we going to be taking yes. this ridiculous monster up and down the street? It's It just wasn't smart for our time. And the thing is, is we want to do that again. We always can. It'd be more fun when my son grows up. and like, hey, let's build another race car, but make it a family thing. So Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to ask, like, um, you know, are you including any of these things that you've done in your books? And, you you know, you just mentioned something about maybe including flipping a house or something. I mean, even the corporate America thing, that's like so many people, you know, are there and aren't necessarily happy about it and reading about someone else's experiences, even through whatever genre you choose in Years of Your uh, Romance. Can you guys can hear me? Oop. I heard you. It is freezing a little. At least for me. Uh oh. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. On whose end is it? Am I... So are we good? Yeah. I think right now you're good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's oh, dance. Okay. I hope we're good. But it's been really windy here, so I mean, goodness knows anything could happen. Um, so <laughs> I guess what was the summary of the question? Because I didn't hear any of it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Basically, I was asking with all of the different kinds of jobs you've had, I thought it was great that you were talking about including uh, at least one of them, if not more than one, in your different romances. Yes, I definitely plan to. So the house flipping one, it was such a huge endeavor. I plan to space that out across three 
probably novellas, maybe full length. And I might do some of the uh, race car building. I'm not sure. Just it's still a sore spot after having to put my baby in the junkyard. I just don't even want to delve into that yet. It was just, it was too hard. And if I have to write about it too soon, I'll relive it. And sure. so I'll probably hold off on that for a while, but the, the house flipping one, definitely. And I always include little tidbits. The jobs that I've mentioned most people have in my books are things that I know. So one of the very first books I wrote, I don't, I did not publish that one, but, uh, she was working in warranty and that's where I started out in corporate America before I moved up the ranks and became a supervisor in there and ran away screaming. Mm -hmm. So I've included a few jobs just about everywhere that I've worked have been, I've included in my books. The most recent one, Charlie's sexy Valentine. Uh, she works as a freelancer and I vaguely mentioned that he had worked in some sort of a uh, firm, but I didn't specify what that was the only thing that I hadn't, any experience with. So I just left it vague. It's like, I don't want to talk about things I don't know about. I got to get this book out anyway. So I just focused on her career as a freelancer, which is what I'm doing now, as well as with the author thing. So in the, uh, the house flipping is going to be the exciting one because, oh boy, I've got stories to tell about that. Uh, the very first house we flipped so far has been our, an absolute nightmare that my husband and I share. We just, we, we say the word, the name of the street that we flipped it on, and it just gives us cold chills. We just start sweating. The very first task we uh, went for that house was doing the roof. And in the middle of doing the roof, I had an eye doctor appointment. I couldn't see very well. I'm like, well, I'm up on a roof. I need to get my eyes up to par. And out of nowhere, we had a pop-up thunderstorm. There was no roof. And there was, it was sunshine, 0% precipitation all week, beautiful. And just this random storm out of nowhere, I swear, just to make us question our life decisions. <laughs> and, oh my God, we, when we got to the house, it was attic, two levels and a basement. And there was just water, just all down in, <sighs> we thought everything was over at that point. So. It, but it ended up being almost like it never happened. This house had already had no ceiling, no walls. It had been vacant for 10 years. There was nothing in it to get ruined. So all we had to do was open the windows, run some dehumidifiers, and everything dried out perfectly. So we were worried for nothing. And we still had to finish the roof, which was terrible. But goodness, yes. yeah, that's one of the things that I definitely, I need to write about it just to yeah. process what on earth we had gone through. But I mean, we bought the house for thirty thousand, and we sold it for a hundred and seven. And that doesn't, depending on where you live, that probably doesn't sound like a lot. But that's in the area we had bought it. It was a pretty hefty price for what we had uh, bought it for originally. So if I were to move that house where I'm at now in Texas, that that'd be probably a three hundred thousand dollar house easy. Mm -hmm. Without the basement, you can't have basements here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a great experience. To write <laughs> I would love to yeah. read that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to write out my angst and make three people suffer for what we had to do. <laughs> the, the worst part is that we didn't know it was in a historic district. So we had to get permission to do every little thing sure. that was annoying. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We talked to you just before we went on air, and you, you were mentioning that you did a lot of things traditional when it comes to publishing and writing your mm -hmm. books beforehand. And lately, you've switched to uh, becoming an independent author. But tell us a little bit about that. So I started my love for books, like most people do, with devouring traditionally published books and having no idea what self-publishing was and no way to even get a self-published book. And when I decided to write my own book, it was with the idea of trying to make it look like something you buy on the shelf next to a traditionally published book. I never planned to quarry and go the traditional route. I wanted to go self-published, but I just had no idea how to do a self-published book. I went about it trying to make it a something that a traditionally published publisher would have put on the shelf. And so my first book, looked like 
that something you expect to see on the shelf in a Barnes and Noble. It doesn't tell you a thing about what the genre is. I mean, what is this a redo of Adam and Eve? You have no idea. So I released it, spent a lot of money on uh, hefty editing and a very expensive designer for the book cover. And of course, nobody had any idea what it was. And it ended up getting the reviews that reflected that people were expecting to get something that they would get off a shelf traditionally published and they were getting what actually was a dark romance. So I didn't know what to do with it and I put it on the back burner and I moved on to my second book which was a typical romance novella. Sorry, kid's toy. <laughs> and this is the book cover I decided to slap on it. Like, you can't tell what's going on here. It's You don't know if someone's going to swoop in from the stars and kidnap these people. What is this? You, you have no idea. And so I just released that right after my son was born, and I just wanted it done, just get it out of here. I'm just done with all this, moving on. And, of course crickets it either no one was picking it up or somebody was they had no idea what it was so i went to an author group that i'm a part of and i asked what am i doing wrong there's i just i'm not making any connections nobody's following anything i just connect with the wrong people and they tore me apart absolutely tore me apart i had the wrong blurbs wrong covers wrong genre I'm doing every single thing wrong. So I had to take a step back and figure out what it is I'm trying to write. What is the connection between the two books? And I ended up discovering the genre of new adult. And that's the only connection these two books have is it's people trying to figure out who they are who are around the ages of the 18 to 30. And they're trying to figure out what they want to do while also building a relationship. And then I rebranded and I don't have the other cover handy for Chains of Nurture. I can pull that up in a second. But this is what replaced this. So you've got some weird, obscure, maybe sci-fi, who knows, to an actual romance that looks like a romance. And once I did that, I discovered that is what I wanted to continue writing, new adult romance, new adult fiction. And so after the rebrand, I began writing and releasing my bubble bath romance collection, which are one hour short steamy romances that are intended to be read in a bubble bath. So I released um, Scarlet's Naughty Christmas in December and then January 26th, the recent release was Charlie's Sexy Valentine. And I plan to release hopefully one a month, as I mentioned earlier. But uh, that's about where I'm at now. Yeah, I, I don't know if you see on the screen, CJ is saying, uh, oh, that must have been so hard to hear after all the hard work. Right, uh, back to the the house or which part? I, I'm thinking the, the rebranding. Covers. Yeah, the covers, the rebranding. Oh, yes. When they tore me a new one, that was rough. I had to definitely take a step back and try to figure out. I, I knew right away what they were saying was true and that I was doing everything wrong. And it was just but it was also like, OK, so I, I have a problem. So now I know how to fix it. Is, whereas before, if it was ever the covers were great and I was marketing right, the genres were great and the reviews were still bad, then I would know it was my writing, the stories, and I had to do some more significant improvements beyond just getting a new cover, beyond rewriting the blurb. So I, I had confidence in the story at that point. It was reaffirmed because once I finally rebranded Black and Blue to the Drunken Promise, the reviews have been amazing. And I mm. read a few of the reviews and just have broke down. And I knew that there was a good story there, but I just didn't know how to get it out. And I was losing confidence up until they tore me a new one. And it was like, finally, <laughs> okay, we know what the problem is. I just couldn't see it without that expert help. Mm. So. Right. David mentions, he says, well done for taking the criticism and using it. So many people can't. So, and, and it's true because I think a lot of people, I, I was actually in a critique group once that tore me apart and I almost went home and just never wrote again. You know, I picked myself up after a bit, but it can be very damaging because you know, this is your baby, invest your heart and soul and all of a sudden yes. people are apart and you're thinking, what am I doing? So I'm, you, I'm normally someone who can't take criticism at all. 
Like if someone just makes a joke about anything to do with me, I can't handle it. But uh, I think that's why I'm actually grateful that I released Chains of Nurture completely misbranded because since I did that, I got all the wrong readers who gave me nothing but negative, terrible scathing reviews because it was someone expecting to read literary fiction and they got a twisted dark romance. And because of those negative reviews, I went into this getting completely torn apart. I'm like, okay, the worst I could ever face has now happened. So now I know what to expect the worst could possibly be. So it's just been go, I hit rock bottom right as soon as I started. So now it's just been going up since then. I think that's what really helps because otherwise had I released it correct and then people started to give negative reviews, I probably would have backed out, just gave up. Mm -hmm. I probably could not have handled it. So. Yeah. yeah, and you're getting a lot of positive stuff in the comments over here too. We're having, <laughs> you know, uh, interest in the bubble bath idea. CJ says, love the short snappy bubble bath books. Great idea. And Amber Sage says, I agree. One hour bubble bath reads are a really catchy, great idea. So, I mean, you know, right off the bat, obviously the branding is working even without yeah. knowing a whole lot about them. Yeah, and it was, I had only done such little research in the one hour idea. I just discovered it through research for a beta reader. And I found with her, she had a, like a two hour read uh, for a mystery story. And so I was looking and I discovered the entire plethora Amazon has of categories for one hour reads. It's, there's so many and I had no idea. And I thought, one hour, I could do that. I could write that out. Let's see what happens. And I just whipped mm -hmm. one out and I had a story I'd half written, but I didn't know what to do with it. And I'm like, 10,000 words, that's not a book. And then I researched it. I'm like, okay, Amazon says it is. Let's yeah. upload and see what happens. That's right. <laughs> so so 10,000 words is a one hour read. Is that what it works out to? Roughly, yeah. And I thought that seems so short. It seems like something you could just do in a few minutes. But the cool thing that I discovered is that Amazon will automatically put you into those categories of 15 minute, 30 oh. minute, one hour, depending on how long people tend to read it. So however often someone's swiping on their Kindle, they will right. determine what category you fit into. So technically the first book, Scarlet's Naughty Christmas is a 90 minute short read, but the second one is a one hour, but the difference is only a thousand words. So the jury's kind of out on that one <laughs> for 10,000 words. <laughs> Yeah, and now you've also got, um, that's two holiday books. So one of them is Christmas and one of them is Valentine's. Are you going to, do you think that you'll continue doing things with holiday books for major holidays? I know that there's, I, I wish I could remember the name of this author, but there's a romance author out there who only publishes holiday books, actually. And it's like any holiday you can think of, just any holiday at all. If I could remember her name, I would, I would tell you what it is. But um, do you think you'll do other holidays as well? I definitely plan to at least include Halloween because that's my absolute favorite holiday. I definitely want to include that. And I might do a few one-offs throughout the year. I definitely want to do one that focuses on birthdays. That'd be kind of universal mm -hmm. for anybody. But yeah. um, I wasn't planning on doing like a holiday theme for every month. The idea would be to do the major holidays and then strewn in between would be just I'd play around with some other types of romances and just see what I get a feel for as I build. This is going to be like my first year with this bubble bath romance. So I plan to do one per month and then get a feel for what I want to focus on. It might dial back to only the major holidays after the first year, but so far I'm just having fun with whatever idea I come up with. The second one, even though it was a Valentine's Day theme, it was actually themed uh, or I had the inspiration off of uh, having issues with my neighbor. So uh -huh. the, that whole, the whole idea for that book came from uh, hate screwing your neighbor because I have many, 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 many issues with my neighbor. And so I wrote my story with similar interactions that me and my neighbor have had, but I decided to make it a romance. So it's kind of my way of, I guess, taking control of the situation and just being able to endure all of the heavy stomping overhead while I'm trying to get my son to sleep at night. <laughs> So that's what my plan is, just each one to just just take random inspiration and run with it. And if there happens to be a holiday I can sprinkle in, then yeah. Sure. Makes total sense. Amber Sage is saying, do you ever find it hard to limit any of your one hour reads to 10,000 words? Like you're getting more ideas for the story, but you have to hold back. That's a great question. I wonder that too. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, so I uh, that happens frequently, and I will if I'm starting to write and it becomes too much, I will either dial it back a little bit and then take those ideas and put it into a different story, or I will uh, set that aside and I turn the one that's come longer into novellas. So I do plan to also release romance novellas. Those will be the short romances that just couldn't be summed up in 10,000 words. And I've already got one and a half of those sitting aside that I'm going to tweak and release as I get time. But uh, yeah, so that does happen quite a lot. I, I'm it happens far more often. It's actually really hard to limit yourself to 10,000 words. If you think about reading, like setting yourself a writing goal, I need to write a thousand words every single day. It sounds so hard, but when you limit a story to only 1,000 words or 10,000 words, it's it's like I can't write that little suddenly. Yeah, <laughs> that would be hard. I can imagine. <laughs> no. Yeah. So what is your advice in terms of like frequent publishing? I know that I think this is your first, your first two that are uh, one month after the other, right? And then you have this plan to continue on. Do you have any advice for those who are looking to do rapid release? I'm sure the short length helps, but still you're putting out, you're trying to put out quality at the same time. Right. Um, I just recently listened to a podcast where they were talking about how you should never rapid release because the idea is you don't have enough time to build up a following. And I can see where that's coming from, but if you have already built up even just a small following and people are expecting a rapid release, then it's very beneficial. My first release, uh, the very first in the bubble bath romance, it got a pretty good response because it was mostly free and it was a short romance. And as we know, romance readers are ravenous. Mm -hmm. But then by the, when I released the next one, it exploded. It became number one across many categories within days. And my other, the very first release was getting redownloaded as well and became, I think, number two in three and several other categories. And so I've been finding that rapid release has been working. But I also can say the other side of it is just need to build up a following a substantial amount of angst for this next book. When am I going to get it so that people are talking about it and anticipating it. And so I'm doing both. I am doing the rapid release for these one hour stories. And then later on this year, I'm releasing a big title called a nickel and a trinket. I'm shooting for July, but it might be later since I'm not anywhere near beginning to pre promote, but I want to try both uh, a long term pre order with a lot of marketing. Nope, we just lost it. You're back. Okay. <laughs> Everything's like this. Goodness. I think we're all used to. I, uh, I, I should over. have warned you. I have severe severe storms. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll blame it on the storms, but it also is just my. If I touch uh, anything that's tech, it will blow up. <laughs> <laughs> that's I have been, I've been through like four laptops since I've started being an author, and. Well, yeah, <laughs> I swear, I, I, I just, I don't know what it is. I can't make anything work. I'll probably go back to a typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> There's 30. Yeah, that, that, should, mm -hmm. that should work out. <laughs> Although the last one I had all of the, the two, two of the keys kept always getting wrapped around each other and just mashing the same spot. And so, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Are you um, building a newsletter at the same time as you're doing this? Like what is your social media or if you don't have any? So I have a newsletter and it's got a pretty good following so far. It's, uh, I, when I very first launched my author career, I did a Gleam giveaway because that's what everybody was doing. This is what you do. And I had gained a thousand followers on Twitter, 300 on Facebook and 500 newsletter subscribers. Like, Oh, I've made it. This is so easy. And of course it was people who just wanted freebies. So there was, it was all bots and garbage and it, nobody was following me because they wanted my book. They just wanted the gift card I was giving away. So I had to start over and I went from 500 in my newsletter subscribers down to, I think I'm like 150 now. And uh, voracious readers only has been 
amazing in helping me find actual readers who want to follow me and aren't just looking for free stuff. There mm -hmm. are still some of those because both my first bubble butt romances so far have been free. So I'm still getting a lot of freebie hungry readers, but my social media, I have taken a step back from because I also was trying so hard to do what everyone else was doing. Mm -hmm. And when I was going the traditional look, route with my books. I was also trying to get a huge following across my platforms and I was a much more active. But then I realized I'm not going to read some rando person's book because they said something funny in a tweet. So chances are pretty good. I'm not going to gain readers by tweeting all the time and by posting funny things on Facebook. So I started dialing back on my social media and just sharing the things that I was interested in and instead focusing on my books, my website and my newsletter. So my newsletter is a lot more intimate than my social media. I will tell the inspiration to my story. I will share pictures of like my son when he was first born, but social media, I'm just kind of, Memes is about as far as you'll get for right now until I get a clear idea of how I want to reach my readers that way. But so far, it's just being kept social distance. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, David Kelly's saying that he finds people who take freebies almost never buy. He's wondering if it's the same for everyone else. I, I've experienced that too. Most of the people that want freebies will only look for freebies which is frustrating if you're writing a series, they'll just read the first book and then they won't care about book two and book three, book four. So I think we all go through that. Yes, definitely. And I learned that the hard way. Everyone kept saying to give away your first one for free because then you'll get tons of sales on your backlist. So if that is true, then with my 1400 of claims for my free book yesterday, I should have gotten some kind of ebook sales, a uh, direct proportion. I was expecting hey, 20%, but I think I got five and it was the one that was on sale for 99 cents. <laughs> so they might want free, but the most they'll be willing to pay is maybe 99 cents. And that's right. only five out of 1400. So yeah, I definitely mm -hmm. agree with that. Free is great for the people who want to just be on your newsletter forever and sit there until you get something else released for free. But I've, found that also to be true. But in the same way too, is like I also want to build a following with people who only want to read stuff for free too, because I probably will release a lot of things for free. And I've noticed whenever I release something new, I tend to also want to give it to my newsletter subscribers, just free, just read it, read it, take it, take it, tell me you love it. <laughs> and yeah, so I, I have a bad habit of just wanting to give a lot of things for free. This because I, I don't know, just the way things are right now, not a lot of people have a lot of money or time to spend on a book. So if someone's genuinely wanting to read one of my books, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. There's there's no way I'm going to turn this into a full time job overnight. And it's been a year and a half and it's still nowhere near that. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm just enjoying the readership. People are actually reading something I wrote. And they actually care. And that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So we got Wanda Janaway. She's asking, uh, would you suggest new authors use voracious readers? I have looked at that a few times, but haven't joined with them yet. Definitely. I am super happy that I did this. I had actually looked at them several times. I was, I'd go to the website and like, eh, this, I don't know. And I'd back out. And then one time I decided to take the leap with Chains of Nurture. I'm like, okay, I want to finally do this. And then it was right in the middle of my rebranding. And I, I emailed the guy, uh, Larry, and he is so personable. He is so directed. It's It's been great just working with him. And I told him, I don't think it's ready yet. So just hold off for now. And so he took me off of the list. And then a few months later, I came back like, okay, let's try again, but with my new book. And it's and it was definitely the best decision I'd made. It was once I knew my product was ready for readers, I finally decided to sign up with him. And had I signed up with Chains, I probably wouldn't have got as great of a response because it was 
still just not correctly branded for dark romance and i'm not sure if that works for his type of platform if there's a lot of dark romance readers so i went with the safer option of my sweet contemporary novella and it's been an amazing response of just all of the newsletter subscribers and they've been interactive and there's still a decent percentage of obvious i, I, don't, I can't really say bots but just obvious people looking for free books and mm -hmm. So I will occasionally clean them for my newsletters, but it's been, I, I definitely recommend Ferocious Readers at this time. Definitely. Ferocious Readers, is, is that just for a certain genre or is that for all genres? Uh, you know, I don't know if he limits by genre. I, I'm i not really sure. Um, I was curious about that as well. And that's one of the reasons I kept backing out because it's like there wasn't enough concrete. This is what you'll get if you're in this genre. There wasn't enough anything that made me feel like taking the leap. But um, I think that's why he offers it six weeks for free because there aren't concrete uh, genre specific newsletters that he sends out mm -hmm. that I'm aware of. So I think he just like, he'll send your book out for six weeks and if it works, then he will like start a pricing package for you. So that way they, he can find out as well as you if there's enough of a readership that he's connected to for your specific genre. Well, that's really fair. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah definitely so do you think i know that you said that you um ran away screaming from corporate america mm -hmm. and i totally understand that 100 percent. i kind of did too but um i wondered if there was anything that you like gained from it in terms of like um your work strategy or anything along those lines that was helpful absolutely, absolutely. so uh goodness that was a nightmare. But one of the major things that I definitely got gained was learning how people worked in a different way. When she, when you're working alongside someone, it's a lot different than when you're managing them. And when you're managing a lot of people, you start to see a different side. They treat you a lot differently and you start to see, it's like seeing a different side of humanity that you can't sitting at a coffee shop, just people watching. Mm -hmm. And so I gained an inner inside perspective as far as being a manager and also just understanding the insane pressures that managers are under and supervisors and everyone on up and and so that definitely helped when it came to writing my stories as far as the per the people go as well as some of the work options but i also learned a lot when it comes to uh, time management because my the job that i had worked was incredibly strenuous. We had such high goals. I had a sit stand desk that you could rise and lower as much as you needed. And I had to, when our goals were really high, I had to raise the desk up and jog in place to get my heart rate up so that I could work fast enough in order to stay with our goal. And just by doing that, I learned that it had to be incredibly tight how I managed my time in order to make my goals. And so I was able to apply that with my author career based off of, I mean, now you've seen I've been able to release so far one per month while writing my big novel while also being a beta reader and a mom and all of the other awful fun things that we do. And it, the only way I would have been able to figure out how to manage so many things is if I hadn't started managing people in corporate America, which if any of you are in it, run away screaming. It's the best thing you'll ever do. <laughs> <laughs> It is an evil place. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So just a little bit off topic, tell me about your three kitty overlords. Oh, goodness. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I had started out with just two black cats, and uh, they're old and ornery mm -hmm. and awful. And we were only planning on having two because it turns out my husband is not much of a cat person. And so 10 years went by and he's just like, how much longer are they going to live? <laughs> and then one day we were driving with a friend of ours and we saw this really strange thing in the road. I'm like, what the heck is it? There's something moving. She's like, whatever. I think it's a squirrel. She started driving and I recognize that it's a kitten. And I start screaming. She has to, she, continues to drive over the poor thing while I'm screaming in the back seat and we have to turn around and a bicyclist on the side of the road had also spotted this kitten as we were getting out and a car is also coming so I jump out of the car this woman jumps off her bike and we dive in front of this car to get her to stop and we managed to save this kitten 
And long story short, now I have three cats. <laughs> we he was just this precious little thing. He was this little five weeks had wandered from a corn field and was in the road and I couldn't leave the poor thing and clean them all up. And now it was my baby. You're not fostering this little thing out. And, and so now there's, yeah, he's just brown little tabby and he's ornery as all get out. They're all just little nightmares. They're like three toddlers, but <laughs> <laughs> now my kid is giving them a run for their money. They just, they're not a fan of him. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> he, he likes tails and ears. <laughs> Do you include uh, pets at all in your books as well? I have started to. There is one in the recent release, and I, I, for some reason, realized I hadn't been writing a lot of cats or anything in my books, and I was trying to figure out why, because it was always my intention. And everything I had written prior to taking this seriously, there was always a cat. Like, I'm not sure why I stopped. So I want to make it a point from now on to always include a cat, because they're just always so fun. And they get up to some shenanigans that will add a little bit of pork to every story. So I definitely plan to from now on, for sure. The latest book, uh, Charlie's Sexy Valentine, I released it so soon, the title came up last minute. So. <laughs> I keep forgetting what it is, but uh, it was actually the cat that was wearing the um, rings for the proposal that happens in the end. So, spoiler. <laughs> not that it's I'm not issue. Yeah, <laughs> like, not really a spoiler. <laughs> but yeah, so I decided just to throw a cat in there and throw some rings around its neck and voila. Oh, let's see. <laughs> so your upcoming book, A Nickel and a Trinket, is, mm -hmm. is it that yet or is it is it in production? It's all, I am, I have it completely, um, let's, let's say like 60% written and 40% plotted out. And I know everything that's going to happen. So it's mostly done. I just have to put the finest, final touches on it. But this is definitely going to be one of the most interesting books that I put out. It's, uh, it's taken quite a lot. And I dive into some very interesting topics in this one. So my main character is uh, Stefan, but he is known by the world as Todd, short for time of death. And he has this ability where if he makes eye contact with you, he can know the time you're going to die. And so most books will focus on how they're gonna die or when as far as day, time, and year. But the idea behind this is if you die at the specific time, you can live your life completely free up except for that one minute every single day. So people are embracing their life and some people throw it off as, the, as just, you know, uh, snake oil, but it become he starts to turn this into a business with his childhood friend of the family, Barry, and they start to travel around the world, kind of like a televangelist style, mm -hmm. and it develops into a cult following. And uh, on the it's it's two main characters, and it's an alternating point of view. And the other character, uh, Desda, she had worked in the she was sex trafficked as a growing up and it was just all she had ever known and she grew up trying to put a stop to it so during the night she tries to save victims of sex trafficking and during the day she's trying to save people who are uh, considering suicide she has a similar ability where she'll make eye contact and in she will hear the method that they're planning to do it so she is working tireless tirelessly to prevent suicides by day and to end sex trafficking by night all to save to atone for the one person as a child she couldn't save. And uh, over the course of the story, their lives have intersected when they were younger and they break apart, but they come back together when there's a missing person and they are not sure how it's connected to both of their lives yet. But um, the idea of the story is also, is part to explore the different methods uh, that people will become obsessed with things they can't control. It's uh, one of the major things that have been in my life is just people who have suffered from um, untimely deaths, from illnesses, from murder and accidents. And it was something I wanted to explore is how it affects the survivors and the people who work so hard to try to prevent other, uh, other accidents and injuries and deaths and you know, something I just wanted to explore, these two people who are fighting so hard to save, basically save the world. And it came to be about um, after I had left corporate America, I was I realized that I was trying so hard 
to save that company because I was so afraid of lives being lost if I didn't do all of these specific things because I was working in an um, in an RV industry and I assumed I was in warranty of the RV industry and I just I felt like I had so much pressure and it, I was so worried I'd do one wrong thing and lives could be lost if I didn't do everything right and I started to crumple under that pressure of And so I wanted to explore it a little bit in this book about how people do crazy things to save even complete strangers, and they take so much blame on themselves. So it's not completely done, but that's where that's the basis for it, and that's where I'm at so far. Awesome. That sounds very interesting. Yeah, it really does. Just real quick, are you going to be branding that one as some kind of a romance, or is that like a totally different genre that you're going after now? So the two main characters do have a romantic relationship throughout this, but since there's so much else going on that doesn't take as much of a primary role, so this is probably just going to be new adult contemporary fiction that also happens to have some romance in it. So Gotcha. Okay. And where can everybody find you? Are you just exclusive to Amazon? Or are you wide? I am wide, yes. So I am across the board everywhere. And also through Ingram so that I can hopefully get some... Uh, books in store as well. So if there's anybody who's got connections to, you know, a library or whatever, you can find me on there, the usual discounts, you know. So I'm everywhere. You got audio books out yet? I don't. That's the only thing I haven't gotten out to yet. And I'm still considering it. I just don't know the direction I want to go because one of the other things that I do a little bit differently is I tend to write mostly from the male perspective. And I, I don't think there are too many men who are willing to narrate a romance so i'm not too sure and it's and also most women probably wouldn't want to have it read to them in the voice maybe i'm right. not sure so i think there's a bit too much of a gamble to get into that just yet to figure out so i'm not sure yet if i'm going to do that mm -hmm. okay okay that's great max so thank you again for joining us and uh, you're welcome to join us again uh, in the future you got uh you release your new book or uh whatever, uh, just let us know and uh, we'll bring you back on. So uh, we'll include your links in the bottom of the, the files that we share. And next week, join us again as we interview uh, J.D. Estrada, author of urban fantasy, middle grade fantasy, poetry, horror, and nonfiction. That's a lot of different genres, so it should be a very interesting interview. <laughs> so thanks again, Max, for joining us. We really appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you, Max. Thanks. Take care. Bye.